Internet, welcome to Film Theory, the show that promises to let you sit and watch public domain cartoons for as long as you want, provided you stab that subscribe button right in the eye. Now, I'm not a man with a whole lot of free time. Between launching new channels, subscribe to Style Theory, by the way, writing and rewriting FNAF timelines, being a father and, you know, just, just trying to have an actual life, things can get pretty darn busy. But in what little free time I've had lately, I've been scrolling through the TikToks to see what's hip with the kiddos, and what I've seen has been been nothing but pages and pages of Pedro Pascal fan cams. Do not make fan cams of school staff. <laughs> oh, you can't stop me, Pedro. I can, and I will. But once I scrolled past those, I was inundated by something far less aesthetic and much more scary. A terrifying new horror movie called Skinamarink. Everything I saw heralded this thing as the scariest movie ever. Because some people are saying this is literally the most disturbing thing they've ever seen. And after watching it, yes. And based on the trailer alone, I was hooked. In this house, in this house, in this house. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have reached peak analog horror. So, intrigued and a little bit scared, I did what any normal person would do. I sat down at 9 a.m. on a Wednesday morning with two of my employees to watch through this puppy. And boy, was it controversial. One of them rated it an eight, the other rated it a zero and said it didn't even deserve to be called a movie. And honestly, I can't really blame him for his opinion. Five minutes in and it's immediately clear why this thing is gonna be a divisive movie. It's about a hundred minutes of staring at dark walls and grainy hallways while people people whisper in the background. It is not for everyone. As for my opinion, I can tell you that it was probably the most active movie watching experience that I've ever had. With my eyes constantly scanning the frame, questioning whether what I was seeing was a shadow monster or just artifacting of the camera. I wasn't just passively watching a movie, I was having to solve each and every frame, trying to understand what exactly I was looking at. TLDR, it worked for me. I really enjoyed it. But not only is Skinamarink a visually challenging movie, it also is a narratively challenging one. The story, as it's presented to us, is about two young children, Kaylee and Kevin, who wake up in the middle of the night to find that their parents have disappeared along with all the house's doors and windows. And so the kids in the movie respond like any normal child would do in this sort of situation. They park themselves right in front of that TV and start binge-watching some old-school copyright-neutral cartoons. Pretty soon, though, things get worse as they begin to realize that they're not alone. Inside the house is a formless demon who makes the kids do horrific things like walk up the stairs and walk up the stairs again. He is a very cardiovascular ghost. Oh yeah, also put a knife in your eye. We don't actually see anything, but the sudden switch to implied violence is just incredibly jarring. Bit by bit, things get progressively worse for our young duo. Toys begin sticking to the ceiling, night lights get unplugged, the toilets disappear. Man, this demon is ruthless. The eye thing, yeah, that was brutal, but making them poop in buckets? That's just cruel. Eventually, Kaylee disappears, leaving the four-year-old Kevin alone in a house that has literally and figuratively turned upside down. As the movie ends, we see this image stating 572 days, which is super random, because up to this point, there really hasn't been any clear focus on the passage of time. And then you have this brutally long pullout shot that lasts almost two consecutive minutes. Just really milking it for that watch time, aren't they? On an unrelated note, did I mention the director for this thing got a start on YouTube? I see you. I know what you're doing. I know your secrets. There's a bit more screaming and whispering in blood before the movie ultimately ends with a blurry figure fading into frame telling Kevin to... <laughs> And uh, that's about it. Clear as crystal, right? Well, yeah, actually, kinda. On the surface, it seems like just another spooky ghost movie. But looking at it that way actually leaves a lot of unanswered questions. What was the monster? Why did everything disappear? Where did the parents go? What is the significance of 572 days? And what does that ending actually mean? In short, this movie is an open invite for theorists to solve. And you know what? I think I cracked it. What seems like a simple ghost story is actually a tragedy. A terribly sad story about loss, grief, and family trauma all told from the perspective of a four-year-old child. 
we see in the film feels like a paranormal situation, right? We hear voices, we see things stuck to the ceiling, we have doors disappearing, and we have this constant grain and distortion. What could cause all of this if not a demon? Well, let's just start from the very beginning. The movie kicks off with a seemingly random event where Kevin falls down some stairs in the middle of the night. We see a series of clips of Kevin stealing blankets from his closet, sitting up on top of the stairs, and then we get an upside down shot of the bottom of the stairs after hearing a loud thud. This is then followed up by his dad on the phone. He's falling, but Kevin fell down the stairs and hit his head. Seems pretty cut and dry. Kevin falls down some stairs and hits his head. There's just one problem with that. This incident is never mentioned again. It is completely arbitrary for everything that comes afterwards. It goes nowhere and nothing comes of it. Why would the director be showing us this then? Why is it the first event of the movie? Well, I suspect it's because this is the real incident that incites everything we see happen afterward. The fall sends Kevin into a coma, and everything we see from that point onward in the movie are the real world events being filtered and processed through his unconscious condition. Now, let me immediately say that I know how lame coma theories are. You can make anything fit into a coma or dream theory because there's no logic in these things. Anything can be bent to be a piece of evidence. There is a reason that across the 1,012 theories that I've written across the last decade, only one of them has claimed that everything was a dream. And that's because I only pull them out when I think that that's the author's true intent. And with Skinnamarink, I am convinced that this is the right interpretation. Obviously, we just talked about the inciting incident of a head injury, but there is so, so much more here. Across the entirety of the movie, there are three random details of this supposed haunting that stood out to me as unusual. The missing toilets, the request to stick a knife in Kevin's eye, and the marker of 572 days. So let's just go back and tackle these one at a time. First, let's just take a look at the basic concept of the film itself. While the idea of doors and windows disappearing from a house makes for a creepy paranormal setup, what doesn't fit quite as well is the disappearance of the toilets. The lack of doors and windows I totally get. You're trapped inside of a situation that you can't escape from. You're at the mercy of the demon. But the toilets? I mean, why would a paranormal entity do that? It's either a big troll, or this isn't actually a ghost that we're dealing with. So let's just assume that everything after Kevin falls down the stairs and hits his head takes place in a hospital. Well, if that's truly the case, then the disappearing toilets would be the reality of his current situation. He's no longer physically going to the bathroom and toilets anymore. Depending on the policy of the hospital he's in, he's likely using a bedpan, diapers, or a rectal catheter to excrete his waste. This would also explain the disappearing doors and windows that form the core of this movie's plot. On one hand, it's symbolic of Kevin now being trapped inside his own mind with no escape. That's why, near the end of the movie, when he asks to watch something happy, we see visions of a door. It's a moment or a chance of escape. But the disappearing doors and windows could also literally be the hospital room around him, a claustrophobic space that's blocked off by curtains. In fact, look closer at your typical hospital room and what do you see in each one? A TV sitting in front of the patient playing all day every day every day. And what do we see in Skinnamarink? A TV as a constant presence throughout everything in the film. So much of this movie is spent sitting in front of a TV, specifically public domain cartoons. It, it's gotta mean something, right? It does. These cartoons are the entire plot of the movie. If you take a closer look at the cartoons that play and when they play, they seem to be telling us the real story of what's happening in the movie. One of the first cartoons we see after Kevin's accident is this, a baby bird being shot out of the sky and appearing dead. This cartoon is the Song of the Birds from 1935, except there's a twist here if you watch beyond what they show in Skinnamarink. When the birds go to bury the baby's body, he wakes up and everyone celebrates. This cartoon, I suspect, is representative of Kevin's injury. He's the baby bird who is knocked unconscious. This clip even plays after the kids ask the question it's because mom thinks that her baby bird is dead, or maybe just close to death. The second major cartoon we see is the Cobweb Hotel from 1936, where two newlywed flies watch helplessly as a young fly is trapped inside a monstrous spider's bed of webs. They then have to fight to escape from the spider. Now, this could very easily be symbolic of Kevin and Kaylee fighting against the monster that has them trapped inside the house, but it could also be Kevin's parents, forced to watch their son trapped inside of a hospital bed, unable to escape. Considering that the two newlywed flies are adults, I suspect it's the second explanation. The third major cartoon reference we get is to 1931's Bimbo's Initiation. This one we don't actually see, but I was able to recognize the audio from research we did years ago when we did our Bendy of the Ink Machine episode about rubber hose animation. <laughs> 
In this one, Bimbo falls down a sewer, only to be locked in a prison of inescapable false doors, all while the world turns upside down around him. Huh, a character falls down, winds up trapped in a place without doors, and everything turns upside down. Why even have a movie, Skinamarink? You told us everything we needed to know right there. And in the final cartoon, 1939's Presto Changeo, we see this clip of a dog that's being shot in the eye. Again, sound familiar? <laughs> The cartoons are telling the story of Kevin's life. And why are they always on? Why are they always playing? Because he's sitting in a hospital room stuck in front of a TV. But with all that said, let's look a bit closer at the eye bit. It's one of the very few moments of implied violence in the movie, so obviously it's gonna stand out as important. But again, why? Why this of all things? Just to shock us? Again, I don't think so. Let's take a look back at what caused Kevin to fall down the stairs in the first place. He only says he Kaylee says he was sleepwalking. Huh. Sleepwalking, hallucinations, eye pain. It doesn't take Derek Shepard to know what's going on with this one. Kevin has a brain tumor. And yeah, that was a Grey's Anatomy reference for any of you under the age of 45. I suspect Kevin was suffering from a tumor on the frontal lobe of his brain, thereby causing him to sleepwalk, hallucinate, and ultimately fall down the stairs. In fact, brain tumors are the most common form of solid tumor inside of children, affecting about 5,000 in the US every year. What I suspect happened here was that the brain tumor Tumor caused his sleepwalking and subsequent fall. And while the fall itself might have resulted in a minor injury, considering what we hear from dad's phone call, the subsequent hospital visit or the damage that the fall caused made the tumor issue worse, with Kevin ultimately winding up in a coma shortly thereafter. So what does all of that have to do with knives and eyes? Well, I don't think that it was just any knife we're talking about here. I think what's going on is a surgical procedure. One way to remove tumors from the frontal lobe of the brain is to perform a procedure known as a supraorbital keyhole craniotomy, a type a brain surgery where they go in through, you guessed it, the eye. It's minimally invasive, and it's an easier way to reach the frontal lobe to remove the tumor, which is why Kevin feels like he's being stabbed in the eye with a knife. This would also explain another weird detail that we see towards the end of the film. At the top of the movie, we get a montage of various family photos hanging on the wall. At the end, we get a similar montage, but this time, everyone is missing their head, or the faces have been weirdly distorted. This would be the result of a condition known as prosopagnosia, also known as face blindness, where you cannot recognize people's faces. It's a symptom that often appears in patients with brain tumors. This leads us then to the ending of the film, where we see blood being sprayed on the floor over and over, all while we hear screaming in the background and the repeating music from the Presto Changeo cartoon, the one where the dog gets shot in the eye. If you turn on the closed captions, the first round of screaming we hear is captioned as child crying. Thank you closed caption people for not naming him the crying child, I just can't rewrite the damn FNAF timeline again. The next round of screaming though is credited as older child cries. The scene, I suspect, is Kevin being operated on over and over over a prolonged period. That's why the blood spills on the carpet repeatedly, why the music is pulled from the cartoon that references his eye pain, and why the subtitles differentiate child and older child. It is two years of Kevin in a coma undergoing procedures like this as doctors try and repeatedly fail at removing the tumor that's endangering his life. How do I know it's been two years? The 572 days marker that we see in the film's final act. At no point in the movie is there ever any sort of emphasis on the passage of time. And yet, for some reason, the film decides to call out this little fact as important. I suspect that this is how long Kevin's in a coma before he finally passes on. They're calling out the final day of his life, and he's being ushered into the afterlife by his mother. You see, at the end of the surgery sequence, Kevin cries out for his mommy. He's looking to her for help, but she doesn't come. It's only in the final shot of the movie that she arrives. This blurry, nightmare fuel, faceless homunculus in the back? Yeah, that right there is his mommy, and she's telling him to go to sleep. To pass on. Kevin is being released from his pain, and the movie ends. But why is his mom here now? Well, to understand that, we have to zoom out. You see, this whole time I've been trying to prove to you that Kevin's in a coma, and I feel real good about that conclusion and the evidence that we've presented so far. But in the process, I've been having to ignore what's happening around Kevin, specifically around his parents. This whole movie's premise is that Kaylee and Kevin's dad disappears one night. Notice that I say dad specifically and not parents. That's actually in the official movie's description. So why is dad gone, and where is mom? Mom. Well, we hear mentions of mom very sparingly. Early on, we hear the question. Shortly afterward, we spend some quality time with mom in one of the most disturbing scenes of the movie. Kaylee is brought up to her parents' room by the mysterious voice. Her dad is sitting, hunched on the bed. Kaylee looks away for a moment, and suddenly her dad is gone, replaced with her mom. After a half-hearted, hey, we're getting a divorce kiddo style talk, we hear a very clear snapping sound. 
This, paired with the repeated imagery we see of dowels hanging from the ceiling, leads me to believe that their mother unfortunately took her own life. She was so distraught over Kevin's condition that she cries repeatedly, the family gets a divorce, and then she ultimately ends it all. This works with why we hear Kaylee asking about the crying, and why at a later point when asked about mom, she says, that's also why mom's at the end of the movie, helping to ease Kevin into the afterlife. It's because she's there too. She's also dead. Okay, so we've established why we don't see mom, but then what explains dad's disappearance? Well, Kevin's dad just doesn't come to visit anymore. We know that Kevin's been in his hospital bed for 572 days based on the text from the end of the movie. 572 days in a coma. Almost two years. Dad just can't do it anymore. He disappears. There's only one person left who wants to come and see Kevin, who will sit with him and watch cartoons with him on the hospital TV, who still talks to him, Kaylee, but even she eventually succumbs to the monster. <laughs> Even she gives up to the hopeless darkness that Kevin won't wake up. Her mouth was stolen. She disappears too, just like everyone else. One of the final shots of the movie is a return to the stair banister, upside down the way Kevin saw it after his fall. This provides our story a complete bookend. We return back to where everything began. The house at this point has figuratively and literally been turned upside down, and now appears to Kevin in the way that he saw it after his tumble. Skinnamarink is a tragic tale of a family broken apart, of a loving father, mother, and sister for forced to confront an unforgiving and unending medical condition, and the little boy who's trapped in a hospital bed with no way out, trying to understand it all through the grainy, dark filter of his unconscious state. Even the name Skinnamarink tells us exactly what this movie's about. It's the name of a children's nursery rhyme all about love. Skinnamarink a dink a dink, Skinnamarink a do, I love you. I love you in the morning and in the afternoon. I love you in the evening and underneath the moon. That is the central theme of the film, love. And that's also the true horror of this film, that there are just some things that love can't overcome. Some things that are so dark, so ceaseless that they swallow all that love away. Whew, this film really hit so much harder than I expected a TikTok hyped art house horror film to do. So if you have kids, give them a hug. If you are a kid, go give your parents a hug. We gotta counteract the horribly sad with something wholesome. But hey, if you ever find yourself trapped in a dream house with disappearing doors and windows, you're probably gonna want some food delivered to you. Well, with the sponsor of today's video, HelloFresh, that dream can become a reality. Hello HelloFresh has 40 weekly recipes for you to choose from, so we always get something new and exciting. And if you're on a low-calorie, carb-smart, or veggie-focused diet, or just a really picky eater, not only are there plenty of options for you, you can also customize your meals, switching out proteins and sides, or even adding proteins to a veggie dish. Steph and I have a lot going on, so getting delicious food delivered directly to our doorstep so we can skip a trip to the grocery store, it is a game changer. It lets us spend more time focused on decoding the stories of strange indie horror movies, and less time deciding on what we want for dinner. HelloFresh also helps us cut back on takeout and delivery, the cost of which can add up real fast. I mean, why go out to get restaurant quality food when delicious food can just show up at your doorstep and you get the satisfaction of making it fresh for yourself? One of the meals we got recently were these delicious Monterey Jack burgers with potato wedges, and it felt so great getting hands-on cooking these things. HelloFresh sends pre-portioned ingredients and easy-to-follow recipes that let us make this incredible hand-cooked dinner without having to think about meal planning or meal prep, and that is awesome. Even better, all the ingredients in this meal were super fresh with less than seven days between these things being on a farm to getting on our doorstep. If you want to try your hand at cooking your own meals with a ton of different options, go to HelloFresh.com and use the code FILMFURY65 for 65% off plus free shipping. Once again, that's HelloFresh.com with the code F-I-L-M-T-H-E-O-R-Y-6-5. Or you can just click the link down in the description if you don't want to type all that out. That is 65% off and free shipping. Not too shabby. Thanks again to HelloFresh for sponsoring today's video and as always remember, it's all just a theory. A film theory! And cut!